Moore Show, presented by the Kellogg Company and the Polaroid Corporation, will not be seen tonight because of this special program, but will return next week at its regular time on most of these stations. I'm standing on a launching pad at Cape Canaveral. Behind me is a Juno 2 missile, a modified Jupiter. Sometime tomorrow, come rain or shine, this missile will attempt to loft a satellite weighing more than 90 pounds and put it into orbit. We've been living with this missile for several months. When we undertook this project, neither the United States Army or the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, nor we, knew whether Project 16 would be a success or a failure. At the time that this is being recorded, we still don't know. They make this missile, and we report its biography. But from the beginning, it has been understood that win, lose, or draw, it would be broadcast on CBS reports on October 27, 1959. This is the cast of characters who helped build Project 16 and whose appetite to teach their fellow Americans makes tonight's biography of a missile a reality. Werner von Braun, at 27, head of the German rocket development during World War II. At 47, technical director of the United States Army Group that built this missile. Well, after the static testing period is over, we bring the missile back to the hangar, clean it, inspect it very, uh, very thoroughly. And then we fly it down to Cape Canaveral, where Dr. Debus runs our missile firing laboratory, and his team will uh, set it up on the launching pad, check it out again, and then fire it. And we will be down there to watch them fire it. Uh, you think it'll work? Oh, it will, certainly. <laughs> Next, the working partnership that actually fires the missile from the blockhouse at Cape Canaveral. Kurt Debus, V2 test director, who fired our first successful satellite, our moon probe, and the space monkeys. I would suppose you have probably shot more missiles than any man on this minor planet, is that right? Well, as far as the Western Hemisphere goes, I would say possibly yes. But uh, I cannot speak for the uh, country behind the Iron Curtain. I don't know what they have been doing. The junior end of the Blockhouse Partnership, Bob Mosier, Vanderbilt University, 1950. Give me a check from all stations. Autopilot rack. Roger. William Pickering, born in New Zealand, director of Caltech's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. <laughs> His breakthrough with solid fuel rockets got our first satellite into orbit. James Van Allen, State University of Iowa. The Van Allen belt was discovered by the radiation experiments of Explorer 1 and 3. This payload could achieve infinitely more. This is the... Uh composite IGY satellite, as we call it. It's probably the most ambitious scientific satellite ever built so far. It weighs, as you know, a little less than 100 pounds. It's uh, been developed by the efforts of very many people at laboratories all over the United States to several man years of work in that little box. Maybe may pay load. Pad safety clear. Telemeter hangar D. Uh to you by Bell & Howell, makers of electric eye cameras, slide and motion picture projectors for the home and classroom, finer products through imagination, and by B.F. Goodrich, creating products to make your home more pleasant, to keep the wheels of industry humming, and to help the free world stay strong. Hi, baby. Your favorite B.F. Goodrich tire dealer's home. Oh, hi, dear. What's new? Oh, it just so happens, my sweet, that today we introduced a brand new tire, the B.F. Goodrich HT Silvertown. Oh, it gets too hot. It does not. It's got four plies of tough heat-resisting nylon cord. Does it smell good? Who cares? It's got a deeper tread than regular tires. It isn't very fat, is it? You nuts! New B.F. Goodrich H.T. Silvertown's got an extra wide tread, extra rubber for extra mileage. And the prices they charge, highway robbery. What? New H.T. Silvertown has the extra strength of nylon, and it's only a couple of bucks more than the regular new car tire. Baby, that's a tire. Tire? I was talking turkey. So's B.F. Goodrich. The new B.F.G. H.T. Silvertown delivers dollar-saving extra mileage. Baby, that's a tire. And now, biography of a missile. Project 16, $5 million. 
18 months from drawing board to launching pad. Ordered by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Built by the Army Ballistic Missile Agency at Huntsville, which last week was transferred to the Civilian Space Administration. Reporter, Ed Morrow. 90% of the weight and bulk of a ballistic missile is a flying fuel storage tank. The skin made of aluminum alloy, less than a tenth of an inch thick. And it'll hold over 100,000 pounds of jet kerosene and highly volatile liquid oxygen, 300 degrees below zero. Because it will be subject to the hot Florida sun, the extreme temperatures in the vacuum of space, and the violent vibrations at its explosive liftoff, it must be perfectly balanced and precision welded to a thousandth of an inch. Next, this welding machine joins the ringlets together. Nine of them make up our missile as they roll through a full 360 degrees under a stationary arc. It was also developed by the Army and then turned over to Chrysler for its Jupiter assembly line, as seen here. Although this is a mass production technique, each weld is so critical that every missile, every section, every weld is minutely inspected and x-rayed. Each missile is given a high pressure water test to simulate flight pressure and to detect any structural weakness. This particular skin buckled in an experiment to determine how much a Jupiter could take. Our Project 16 skin passed its test and then moved across the vast Huntsville Fab Lab to be married to the giant rocket engine, whose enormous fuel reservoir she will be for the first three minutes of Project 16's planned eternity in space. 11 months ago and 2,100 miles away in the canyons of Southern California, the engine, sometimes called a rocket, sometimes called the power plant, sometimes the booster, is born. Produced by Rocketdyne, a division of North American, it is sold to the government for a quarter of a million dollars. On a mandrel, shaped like a dressmaker's dummy, tubes of nickel are banded together into what will be the thrust chamber, where the kerosene and liquid oxygen will be united to form a white, hot, gaseous mass which exhaust from this tailpipe nozzle at a speed of more than a mile a second. Turbo pumps force feed the thrust chamber at the incredible rate of about 600 pounds of fuel and oxygen per second through a perforated shower head, which will spray the equivalent of more than a 55 gallon oil drum per second. Here in a valley of the moon atmosphere in the Santa Susana mountains, each engine is tested first by components, and then as an entire power plant. Each full test will burn $10,000 worth of fuel and liquid oxygen. This engine, which has 150,000 pounds of thrust, equal to the thrust of 20 F-86 jet fighters, which this company also made, is basically the same engine made for the Air Force's Thor and Atlas missiles. But up until now, the engine has not been part of a missile. Its fuel has come from fixed storage tanks, which have been used to make hundreds of such tests. Now in Huntsville, the first two major components are aligned and meshed into what will, from now on, be referred to as the main stage or first stage booster. In this new missile configuration, it must be tested again to ensure compatibility. During this live firing test, the missile will be held down by a huge steel ring embedded in 50 feet of reinforced concrete. A waterfall of 9,000 gallons per minute keeps the steel deflector plate from burning up. In the blockhouse, an electronic fortress, a thousand feet removed and connected to the missile by a tunnel containing over 1,100 information and control channels, we talked with Dr. Von Braun. Ah. Uh, uh, uh. Dr. Von Braun, this is the second time we've seen that engine tested on a static stand. This is perhaps a good time for me to ask you the basic question, what makes it go up? Well, a rocket motor can be compared with a machine gun the machine gun fires uh, small bullets in a rapid sequence out of the barrel and each little bullet as it leaves the barrel exerts a recoil onto the breech of the barrel 
Maybe you could uh, best explain this uh, at the blackboard. Good. Suppose this is the rifle barrel, and this is the bullet. Now, if you put a powder charge in here and ignite it, this powder charge will exert a pressure onto the bullet, and which drives the bullet out of the barrel. Yes. But an equal force will be exerted onto the breech of the gun. There, of course, also forces in this in this direction, but they are cancelled out because they act against the barrel itself. But this force here is not compensated. So whereas this force drives the bullet out of the barrel, this acts against the breech, and it is this force that we feel as a recoil uh, slamming against our shoulder when we fire a rifle. Now in a machine gun, you start feeding new bullets in here and new cartridges, and as a result, you get lots of little pushes. Yes. Now on a rocket motor, the situation is quite similar. If this is a rocket motor, and we inject a liquid propellant and a liquid oxidizer, such as liquid oxygen, into this motor and burn it here and generate gas, millions of little gas molecules will start streaming out of the nozzle. And each of these molecules represents a little bullet, which exerts a little recoil onto the backside of the gun. So there will be thousands or millions of little recoils acting in this direction. And the total sum of these recoils is the thrust of the motor. How does it operate when it's up there where there is no air, or it's in a vacuum. This is fuel, and this is oxygen. Since in the vacuum of outer space, we have no air in which the fuel could burn, a liquid fuel rocket has to carry its own oxygen. It carries its own oxygen. Yes, a rocket engine is the only conceivable engine that could work in the vacuum of outer space. Well, I now understand how it gets its thrust, what brings it off the ground. But I noticed that this thrust chamber out there was swiveling, twisting about. That's part of the process of steering it, isn't it? Yes, it works very much uh, the same way like the swiveling of an outboard motor on a boat. You also swivel the thrust axis uh, under which the propeller is exerting thrust onto the boat. Dr. Von Braun, we've been talking with a number of your colleagues here for the past few days. And they all keep saying, uh, we didn't really do very much about this. You know, ours was just a minor contribution, but this was a team effort. How does the team operate? Do you have big formal sessions and exchange minutes and long memos, or just how do you go about it? Well, I would say the better the team, the fewer uh, meetings you need and the more business you can handle over the squawk box. Even when putting a team together, you should not try to find people whom you can outsmart, but people who are smarter than you in their particular field. And uh, the smarter the people in the working level are, the better is the team. I think nothing hurts uh, uh, team effort and uh, any greater development effort, like development of guided missiles, more than this, uh, you might call, Pappy knows best attitude on the part of the top management. Pappy just doesn't know best. He gets the best answers if he ask the man who has to do the job. Well, now, Dr. Von Braun, what are you working at out here on the left side of that tower, which is, what, about 22 floors high, something like that, isn't it? Yes, uh, we're converting the left side of this tower uh, for the static testing of our new Saturn booster. This will be uh, the biggest rocket that has been tried anywhere, probably including the Soviet Union. It will be our a next generation space vehicle. It will uh, produce one and a half million pound thrust with uh, eight engines, uh, which are in a way an advanced version of the engine that you see right there, the Jupiter engine. Only we're going to have eight of them. Eight all in a cluster? Yes. And uh, just to illustrate the tremendous power and dimensions of this unit, it will use a complete ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile, as a second stage. And what about the third stage? Well, there would be a pretty advanced and sophisticated third stage. The total thing will be a three-stage vehicle, and it will be able to carry many times 10 tons into orbit in one flight. Well, is that the one that will send up the astronauts? 
Well, the, the astronauts will first uh, begin some rather modest flight tests on redstones, just over ballistic ranges. What do you mean by modest test? Well, uh, the apex will be only about 80 miles up, and the range will be 200 miles, and the flight will last only about 10 minutes, out of which six minutes will be weightlessness. Thereafter, they will board an atlas and go into orbit. Now, with our a Saturn vehicle, we can uh, launch a whole busload full of astronauts in one flight into orbit. So this will be the real spaceship. Well, is, is there in theory any limit to the size of the object that you can hoist up there? No, well, so the, uh, the only limitation that I know of is the taxpayer. <laughs> Biography of a missile continues immediately after this word from B.F. Goodrich. B.F. Goodrich reports on space, space, the unknown wilderness of the stars, which man, in his search for knowledge, is almost ready to explore. When our first spaceman sets foot on the moon, chances are he'll be wearing this full pressure suit developed by B.F. Goodrich, already approved for the Project Mercury astronauts, the seven men selected to be America's space pioneers. This B.F. Goodrich full pressure suit maintains a safe artificial environment at any operational altitude and will give mobility and protection against decompression, blackout, and exposure to extreme temperatures. But what of the spaceship that will carry our man to the stars? B.F.G. Research has developed high-energy propellants for rocket launching, and B.F. Goodrich high-voltage astronautics now have under development an engine designed to generate speeds of 100,000 miles per hour. Important B.F. Goodrich advancements in nose cone fabrication, plus the use of unique new materials, are helping to solve the problem of re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere, where air friction creates temperatures as hot as the sun. Yet, when it touches the ground, even a rocket ship needs landing gear and tires. B.F. Goodrich makes the only tire approved for landing at speeds in excess of 300 miles per hour. This is the tire actually used on the famous X-15 rocket ship. B.F. Goodrich the leader in tires qualified for the military services, uses this know-how to develop smooth riding, long-lasting tires for your car. Your nearby BF Goodrich dealer knows what tires you should have to give you more mileage per dollar for whatever kind of driving you do. See him soon. BF Goodrich, working toward the future to help build a good, rich life for you. But if a missile had only a power plant and a fuel storage tank, it would still be nothing more than a mammoth 4th of July skyrocket. What distinguishes Project 16, or any ballistic missile, from uncontrolled fireworks is the guidance and control section. In a manned bomber, it is the pilot, the navigator, the engineer, and all the instruments of their flight deck. This section of our missile, which will be attached just above the booster unit, is eight feet high and contains more than a hundred sensing and command instruments. The whole guidance and control system is made by the Ford Instrument Company division of Sperry Rand and sold to the government for about $200,000. The heart of it is the gyroscope platform, made under surgical conditions to tolerances of a 50 millionth of an inch. When this gyro, or any gyro, is not energized and spinning, it has no stability and no effect upon the missile or itself. The unit has three whirling gyros in principle like a child's toy, which make it possible to keep the missile stable and aimed. At Huntsville, Alabama, this simulated missile was built over this gyro platform to teach us how it operates in flight. Mr. Mueller, we're surrounded here by some of the elements of the guidance and control section. This is the gyro. How would a layman best describe that? As an automatic pilot or the helmsman for the entire missile? Well, I would say, uh, the helmsman, that's right, was a complete guidance system. It is uh, the instrument which uh, measures what the missile is doing, deviations from the prescribed trajectory. It is uh, essentially a sensing instrument. And it knows where the missile is at all times? It knows exactly where the missile is at all times. This is right. It knows the angular position of the missile, and it knows the deviation from a prescribed trajectory. Then, Mr. Mueller, as I understand it, this gyroscope remains fixed in space, no matter what happens 
to the missile. It makes corrections, and if it had an eye on the top of it, that eye would be fixed on a specific star all the time. If a man could ride in that missile and look through that eye, he would always see the same star during the flight, regardless of what the missile is doing. And it floats completely free. It floats completely free. Now, Mr. Mueller, if we regard this gyro stabilizer as the helmsman or the pilot, at some point it is going to get an order to change course, to alter the course of the missile. Who or what gives that order? Uh, this order is coming from a tape machine, which is also built into a missile. You mean a tape machine like we use in radio? Oh, very similar. A little bit more accurate. This uh, tape here carries uh, a few channels of information. This information is all pre-calculated. And uh, during the flight, we pick up this information and feed it into this gyroscope here. And as a consequence, this gyroscope will initiate the turning of the missile. So that at some point on a time basis, the tape machine tells the gyroscope to alter course. Yes, this is right. But the tape machine has only predetermined information. This is right. put on it in the ground. On the only ground. the predetermined information. The information which we gain during the flight is gained by this instrument here. The gyro-stabilized platform. All this information we feed into the computers. And some predetermined information is also set into the computers. And uh, these computers will compare these values and make certain decisions. For instance, uh, the computers have to decide when the thrust has to be cut off of the power plant. And when the satellite finally reaches orbit, all of this material, of course, is destroyed and burns up as it reaches the Earth's atmosphere. Yes, everything is lost. We have only the payload, finally, but these uh, instruments are of no value anymore. A missile has been called an exercise in perfection. The blending of 100,000 different parts and instruments into an orchestrated technological entity where one bad note, one malfunction, means disaster for the whole. Almost every misfire in our nation's missile program has been traced to such a failure, and every failure has produced a new testing sequence. There is no end to the checking and testing. A gyroscope that works in a lab won't react the same way as it will when exposed to the shock and recoil vibrations of those millions of molecular machine gun bullets that Dr. von Braun described. So it is tested under conditions of extreme heat and cold, and shaken. A precision instrument, such as the accelerometer, may have to respond accurately to a force of 15 times that of gravity. So it is exposed to 20 Gs. The satellite itself will be baked, shaken, and spun on the ground to ensure its accurate performance. Most of what the scientists learn from it, and from the missile, will come back through a system called telemetry. For in space, there can be no tunnel of multiple wired circuits, such as Dr. Van Braun demonstrated at the static test. Small sensing organs in the missile transmit vital information by radio, from space down to the telemeter equipment on the ground, where the real autobiography of a missile is written. Otto Hoberg prepared this telemetering demonstration for us. All right, Mr. We're separated by only about 20 feet, but actually it's as though you were up in that missile about 500 miles over the equator, and I am down here on the ground. Are you ready, ready on the ground? Ready on the missile. <laughs> we have a temperature measuring gauge mounted on the missile. Now I apply heat. Do you see the effect? Oh, yes, yes, of course. It's going up. Very nice. Is it being recorded as well? Yes, and, and the graph is coming out here on the data printer, too. It looks to be identical. Is that the way it should be? This is the way it should be, exactly. Now, uh, what about vibration? I was oh. once told by a missile man that if I didn't understand anything after a long explanation, I should just say, what about the vibration? Can you demonstrate the vibration? Yes, I certainly can. We measure, in fact, the number of vibrations outside on the missile skin. Oh, yes. And this vibration is, is transmitted through the telemetering system down to the ground 
And by the way, do you see it? Oh, yeah. Will you come down to Earth or shall I come up there? You better come up to space. <laughs> Approximately 13 months after fabrication began, Project 16 is coaxed up the ramp of a MATS Globemaster transport for shipment to Cape Canaveral. Actually, one of the criteria that helped determine the Jupiter size was that it could be carried in this airplane and that it could be pulled through the burned tunnel in the Swiss Alps. At Cape Canaveral, an Air Force installation operated by Pan American Airways, where all three services fire missiles. Project 16 is trucked to pad five and hoisted into position. The gantry crane, which will service it for the next five or six weeks, rolls into place beside it and around it. But what you are now looking at is still a long way from the finished Juno missile. This is only the first stage, the liquid fuel part, which will hoist the payload only to the edge of space. The final kick, which will last for only a matter of seconds, will develop power equal to five diesel locomotives and be in the form of 15 small solid fuel rockets, such as the one we are now looking at. These rockets, arranged in a three-stage cluster, were pioneered and tested by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology. During a spin test, which is similar to what happens in flight, Dr. Pickering explains to reporter Jack Beck how it works. Now we, we have the cluster assembled. We see the, the cluster of 11 rockets first, and then three rockets that fits inside the group of 11, and then the single rocket, which constitutes the fourth stage. And on so, top of which goes the and payload? And then we put the payload on top of this. The scientific instruments go up here. So then, when the assembly is launched from the uh, front end of the Jupiter, the cluster, the spinning cluster, just comes out of the tub. And first, the 11 rockets fire, then the three rockets, uh, and uh, then the single rocket, so as to bring the payload up to the necessary speed of about five miles a second for a satellite. Why do you spin the upper stages of the rocket, Dr. Pickering? By spinning the cluster, the rockets come shooting out of this tub and maintain their direction uh, quite accurately. Well, this is roughly analogous then to the rifling in a rifle barrel, is that the same right? Same sort of thing, yes. To keep it mm -hmm. true on its Keep course. it true, right. Now about the system itself, is three the magic number or do you foresee that in some future time you will have uh, a greater number of successive stages firing? Well, if I think about a uh, space vehicle which is perhaps going to uh, land a man on the moon or another planet and bring him back to Earth, uh, then I add up a lot of stages because uh, uh, whatever it takes to get him up to speed, uh, I then have to add uh, a stage to slow him down on the moon, a stage to get him off or perhaps two, another stage to slow him down when he comes back to the Earth. So it adds up to seven or eight stages, perhaps. How far away is that, sir? The moon, a quarter of a million miles. No, the time. time <laughs> it'll be several years. A courier from Caltech will accompany the cluster to the Cape. The second and third stages are lifted up onto the top of the booster stage, just above the guidance section. This is the ultimate, the final product. Everything that we have seen so far has been designed to lift this payload into orbit. It weighs about 90 pounds. And Dr. Van Allen, before they take it out and put it on top of the missile, perhaps you would explain to me what's in it and then later what it's designed to do. Now this is a uh, shell made of fiberglass. On it are mounted uh, solar batteries. Now these little black cells uh, receive energy from the sun, convert it to electrical energy, and serve to power the electronic apparatus which is inside. And the power comes from batteries, and the batteries in turn are charged by solar energy, right? Uh, that's correct. And there are two transmitters, and these are the batteries around the outside, yes. correct? Yes, each one of these uh, cells contains the chemical storage batteries. Uh, they power the apparatus while the satellite is in the shade of the Earth on the back side from the sun. Then uh, while it's in sunlight, the solar cells recharge these batteries and also power the apparatus. And how long will this satellite remain up there? Uh, ideally, we expect it, if successful as planned, to remain up for many years. However, the operating lifetime is limited to one year. 
by this little cutoff timer, which is an electrically driven, driven clock. The uh, purpose of this is to remove this one transmitter from the radio spectrum so that we won't, so to speak, jam this frequency forever. Make room for another one to operate, yes, is that that's right? correct. That's correct. Now, this is one antenna here, isn't it? Uh, this is correct. This is the 108 megacycle antenna, these four uh, arms. And the others come out here, here and here, right? Yes, the 20 megacycle antennas must be much longer for efficiency. Total span, 24 feet in flight. This, this, inside this column is the payload inside the payload, isn't it? Yes, yes. This is where most of the instrumentation is. We can look at the inside. <coughs> Dr. Van Allen, I wonder if you could uh, run down the passenger list in this for us. Yes. It has a composite of five different basic experiments. In addition to the cosmic ray heavy nuclei, and our radiation package on the top. There are two devices for studying the soft uh, radiations from the sun, those which never penetrate the atmosphere and are inaccessible from the Earth's surface. Those are the solar uh, X-ray uh, cell and the solar ultraviolet cell of Dr. Friedman's at the Naval Research Laboratory. Now, each one of these individual uh, decks, as we call them, or uh, flat pillbox-shaped uh, decks, contains electronic equipment. Each slice is chock full of transistors and other circuit elements which are associated with the individual detectors delivering to the ground station the information as to what's happening in the bird. Uh, then there is a very pretty meteorological experiment prepared by Professor Sumi at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, this is designed to measure the heat balance of the Earth. The energy received from the sun by the Earth, the energy reflected from the Earth, and the energy emitted from the Earth as a warm astronomical body. These, the combination of these determines the Earth's weather. And what roughly will be the orbit? That will sweep as far north as the southern tip of Hudson Bay, as far south as Cape Horn, South America, for example. Now it is midnight of the final day, 12 hours to zero. And Bob Mosier begins his countdown. T minus 640 minutes, six, four, zero minutes. Clear to lift four stage to the third level. Lift the four stage to the third level. At zero minus 10 and one half hours, the final stage rocket is hoisted into position high above the pad and made part of the cluster. T minus four, 10. Clear to lift the payload to the third level. Lift the payload to the third level. At 2.45, as the payload is hoisted into position, we stood in the blockhouse with Dr. Debus, who will direct the firing of Project 16, and talked about the shot. Now, Dr. Debus, when you shoot, the booster, the engine that we saw being made in California, will lift the entire missile. And how far will it carry it? It will carry it until burn out of the first stage. And how long will that take? It will take 178 or thereabouts seconds. And how will you know whether it comes up to expectations? Well, we'll follow these recorders here, and in the recorders we have a pretty good indication whether we stayed close enough to the anticipated trajectory. We will hear a sound. There will be a growling noise after 10 or 15 seconds, which is a dober beat, as we call it. Yeah. And it will be something like that. Uh, and then it will gradually pick up. Now, this is the most satisfying noise you will hear in the black heart. This pleases uh, you, does it? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, the, as the velocity follows a pre-drawn trace, we hope, there will be uh, an indication of to the uh, accuracy with which we will obtain the azimuths. And where will it be when the first stage falls away? When the first stage falls away, it will be 90 miles out, about. At this point, then, we have obtained sufficient velocity to carry the upper configuration, that is, the instrument compartment and the spinning cluster, to the point where we want to ignite the upper stages. Lift the shroud and shroud support on the missile. At 4.45 a.m., the satellite having been secured, the shroud, which covers the payload and the second, third, and fourth stages, is hoisted to the top of the gantry and fastened into place. 
You have no yeah. control once that missile is one inch off the launching pad. No control from the ground, right? No control from the buckhouse. The flight safety people can cut it off if it misbehaves. This is the only control that we as humans have. All right. Now, if it does it in any dangerous way, the flight safety officer will cut it off. Dr. Davis, every single act, every item in the checklist is critical, and yet the atmosphere around here seems to be relaxed and rather informal and easygoing. How do you maintain discipline? Uh, we, we do not maintain discipline in, in this sense of the word. Uh, discipline is there. It is a voluntarily broad contribution to our functions of every single individual. In, in major areas where it counts, you, we have examples where human errors were made, and they are made everywhere humans are at work, where after a firing, voluntarily a contribution was made of, a, of an error. You mean a man comes in and says, I turned the wrong screw or failed to couple something up? This is right. This, this has happened in, in two instances where <coughs> discipline, of course, would be the wrongest thing to apply. Uh, it is not the fault of the man. Uh, maybe it is a fault of, of the functional subdivision of work where we would have to look in. But uh, it is a voluntary acceptance of the better knowledge of the supervisor that leads to a condition of this relaxed atmosphere you see here, and not an external discipline that is rammed down the throat of somebody. Biography of a missile will continue with the countdown immediately after this word from Bell and Howell. These two 8mm movie cameras just filmed the train ride all by themselves. I'm Jim Thorne, reporting a demonstration that proves the new Bell & Howell Electric Eye movie camera, the Perpetua, automatically adjusts its lens to changing light, even while it's shooting. Now here are the results of that ride. Both cameras start out with the right lens setting, but as the light dims, it's the Bell & Howell that responds automatically. Now, bright sunlight. And again, it's the Bell & Howell that adjusts while it's shooting. The reason? This perpetual motion electric eye. See the needle move? That means the lens is adjusting instantly, automatically, to changing light. With the Perpetua, you never make an adjustment. Never. Single lens or three lens turret from 99.95. From Bell & Howell, finer products through imagination. At 6 a.m., fueling begins. The tactical Jupiter's fueling can be done in a matter of minutes. In space probes, it takes an hour. T minus 275, 275 minutes. Install the angle of attack meter. Install the angle of attack meter. At 7.40 a.m., the angle of attack meter, which senses the external wind for the guidance system, is fastened on top of the shroud. T minus 215 minutes, 215 minutes. You have a clearance to load locks. You have a clearance to load liquid oxygen. The liquid oxygen is now being pumped aboard. It comes from three trucks. It's weighed as it goes aboard. There will be about 30 tons of liquid oxygen when the fueling has been completed. In temperature, it is almost 300 degrees below freezing. At 10.30, the mosquito-filled Florida night, which gave way to the dank dawn, has been replaced by the humid mid-morning sun. The missile, now 300 degrees cold inside, is subjected to 100 degree heat on the outside. The clash between the frost and the sun causes the skin to groan and shrink perceptibly, as the scale and the instruments keep its weight and alignment constant. The final tapes, which have protected the missile from the elements, are torn off. T minus 100 minutes, one zero zero. Attention all personnel, please clear the service structure and pad of all non-operational personnel for connection of the destruct package. At zero minus one and one half hours, the destruct package, which as Dr. Debus yeah. explained, will be used to destroy the missile if it becomes a menace to population, is electrically connected. The technique involves a long explosive primal cord attached earlier which will be responsive to a radio signal from the range safety officer and will cause the tanks to rupture if necessary. 
At Central Control, the range safety man for Project 16, Air Force Major Hal Fitzpatrick, watches the final steps of the countdown with a combination of television monitors and radar equipment. The decision to destruct, if and when, is his alone. T minus 75 minutes. You are now clear to remove the service structure. Remove the service structure to firing location. The gantry crane pulls back on its railroad track, leaving Project 16 alone and sweating. There is less than 55 minutes remaining. All the visitors and brass, except General Barkley, either he or General Madaris is present at all major shoots, leave the area. Now all the fuel trucks and service vehicles, including the chow wagon and the fire engines, depart as the warning lights and claxons close the area. The blockhouse is sealed. T-minus 13 minutes. Cluster control panel, speed regulator power on. Speed regulator power on. Roger, clear to bring the cluster motors up to launch RPM. Roger. Under the shroud at the top of the missile, the tub holding the cluster of solid fuel rockets begins to spin. 50 RPM. 100 RPM. Elevator is going on. Pre-flight calibrator from 0% to oscillator. At 0 minus 8 minutes, the Mosier T time means 0. The telemetering calibration test begins. This is the final scaling of the gauges. When the missile is airborne, these gauges will indicate the actions of the missile. At this point, they are being artificially stimulated in cadence to establish telemetering accuracy just before launch. to internal power. Cluster motors in, on internal. Until this moment, the missile has gotten all its power from normal ground generators. Just before launch, it switches to its own internal batteries. It is tested briefly now and then, quickly returned to ground power to preserve the batteries. D760. That's the transfer switch off. Stand by the cluster state on internal. That's on internal. All right. Stand by for power transfer off. Power transfer test off. Power transfer test off. Roger. Thank you. Give me a check from all stations. Auto pilot rack. Propulsion panel. Generator panel. Roger. Measuring panel. Cluster control panel. Roger. Guidance rack. Fast safety. We're T minus three minutes on my mark. Mark, minus three minutes. The missile is now alive with spinning hardware. The gyros are spinning, the satellite is spinning, and if one could see the cluster, it would look like this. The best 30 seconds on the struck package. Struck package, though. Fast safety, no. Roger, Range safe indication, Roger. Minus two minutes. Frank need to launch position. Frank need to launch position. Verify pre launch out, launch on. Roger. Payload timer zero. Payload timer zero. Put a link okay. Roger. Stand by to transfer the cluster into internal. One minute, 40 seconds. One minute, 35. One minute, 30 seconds. Transfer cluster to internal power for flight. Cluster on the internal. Verify ready to fire. Telemeter tape on. Telemeter tape on. Tape 
command button does not actually fire the missile, but sets into motion a series of automated commands, which terminate 45 seconds later with final ignition and takeoff. 40, 16 came to an untimely end. We have its twin underway. We're planning to, to another shot of this same payload and the same missile in two months. On Monday of next week or three days from now, we will have a definite schedule and we're already at work to replace this and have another shot which we hope will accomplish the scientific mission that was intended for this one. Well, we hope you'll permit us to be with you when you fire the next one. Twenty-four hours ago, when we were shooting some of the assembly of the component parts of this missile, we thought that by this time we would be tracking it while it was in orbit. As you see, this is what is left, 
of Project 16. The disappointment is not the loss of money, the twisted metal, or the man hours involved. It is rather the fact that had it succeeded, it would have pushed back the frontier of man's knowledge just a little. A payload would have been one of the reaching fingertips of science that would have brought to mankind a little knowledge that he never before had had. So this is the end of this particular project. There will be another, and when it is done, we shall hope to report it to you. A brief footnote is required here. The post-mortem Dr. Debus mentioned was completed less than a week later and revealed that two diodes in the inverter, shown here, which should have been a quarter of an inch apart, touched during vibration at liftoff, shutting off power to the guidance system and causing it to fail. Dr. Debus reports that in the future all inverters will be potted in a special plastic compound to prevent such a thing from happening again. There is an important epilogue to the story of Project 16, which Mr. Murrow will report to you after this word from Bell and Howell. Watch. Bell and Howe's new 8mm projector is about to thread itself. There it goes. I'm Jim Thorne. I get a lot of fun out of showing home movies. This Bell and Howe autoload projector makes it easier than it's ever been before. The autoload actually threads itself. I can even use crumpled film. Watch. There it goes again, perfectly, all by itself. And if old film with stamped sprocket holes causes fluttering like this, I just touch the automatic loop setter and the show goes on. Watch what Bell & Howe's optional zoom lens does. Zooms the picture to fit the screen. Autoload, the new automatic way to enjoy your home movies. The Auto Load, just $139.95 or only $14 down from Bell & Howe, finer products through imagination. Project 16 died on July 16, 1959. Three months later, on October 13th, just two weeks ago today, they tried again with 16A. The same kind of Juno 2 missile, the identical IGY satellite payload. As before, the countdown started 12 hours before launch time. Liftoff was 10.30 Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> As the 60-ton space vehicle slowly lifted itself off a meticulously clean pad, Dr. Debus and his colleagues watched from the front of the blockhouse. Then they all moved to the telemetering panel to sweat out the mission. In the first 18 seconds, the missile rises only 1,200 feet. As the Dovap tone increased to that satisfying growl indicating proper performance, the gyroscope informs the computers that the tape machine can begin to program the trajectory of the missile. At the beginning, the arc northward is imperceptible. At 20,000 feet, the arc increases. At 55,000 feet, or 90 seconds after takeoff, the big bird is visibly on its way northward. Can you turn up the tone a little bit? Good. Let it, let it sound. Let it sound. The big Jupiter booster, now practically drained of its fuel and liquid oxygen, was scheduled to have cut off its engine after 180 seconds. It came at 179 seconds. Separation, which means the empty booster dropped off from the upper stages, occurred six seconds later. This is still okay here. Yeah, once in a while. It's very quiet. It's very quiet. It's very quiet. At 214 seconds, the shroud was jettisoned. Again, from a signal programmed into the tape machine. Now you have to wait. For the next six minutes, 
There is nothing to do but wait. Now, right on schedule at 542 seconds, the second stage, the cluster of 11 spinning solid fuel rockets are fired. Nine seconds later, the third stage of three rockets fired. Again, nine seconds later on, or nine minutes and 45 seconds after liftoff, the final rocket pushing the satellite ignites. And precisely six seconds later, hurls the satellite into orbit. It is now 1,030 miles from Cape Canaveral, southeast of New York and Philadelphia, and traveling 17,000 miles per hour. And if a camera could see the satellite, it would look like this. But if it can't be seen, it will soon make its new voice heard round the planet. For the success of 16A will not be assured until tracking stations around the world report in. Then, at 100 minutes, the Goldstone tracking station in the California mountains tracked the satellite crossing the Pacific coast in its first pass over U.S. soil. The 90-pound scientific payload is now firmly in space circling the Earth once every 101 minutes. Much will be learned from Project 16A about the cosmos of outer space. But perhaps even more will be learned from the tragedy and failure of Project 16. That is the end of our biography of a missile. It also marks the end of the Army's career in space. For last week, the President transferred von Braun's Huntsville team and their Saturn project to the National Aeronautics and Space Agency. If Explorer 7 is to be the Army's last salvo in space, it is perhaps a fitting epitaph. Good night and good luck. This is a slide projector, the most unusual and exciting slide projector there is. I'm Jim Thorne reporting for Bell & Howell on the new Explorer, a slide projector that does more than any other. It not only shows slides for you automatically, but it's the only projector with this new kind of remote control point array that lets you hold a slide, reverse, and start forward again. Your slides stay in focus because they're locked in focus. And this exclusive lens even zooms the picture to fit the screen. There's never been a projector like it. The Explorer. Four brilliant bottles from $8 down from Bell & Howell, finer products through imagination. CBS Reports has been brought to you by B.F. Goodrich, making news in chemicals, plastics, and rubber with thousands of products to help make a good, rich life for you. And by Bell & Howell, makers of electric eye cameras, slide and motion picture projectors for the home and classroom. Finer products through imagination. This is Howard K. Smith. One of the chief unsolved problems of our time is the dizzily increasing number of people trying to make a living on a limited earth. Watch the CBS report on the population explosion on November the 11th.